Good morning, everyone. So uh, I was asked to uh, start my service today. Uh, and at the last moment, I was asked to sing a solo. Or maybe do an interpretive dance, but we don't want everybody to do that. I'm sure you <clears throat> you know, I, I was thinking about this one. Like, you really want to. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about uh, the experience here at ECC, you know, on, on Sunday mornings, and how it contrasted with my early experience at church. Imagine a fairly large, austere building with hundreds of people in it, and you can hear a pin drop. You know, and, and that does inspire some reverence. You know, but there is. A passage in the Bible, if you pardon my paraphrase, that says that when we love one another, the world will sit up and take notice. Yeah. And I, I love being in a church that, that values community and that connects and we connect with every, you know, one another. Now, after being exposed to this kind of church, and this happened fairly early in my late teens, but occasionally I found myself in the middle of a crowd in a foyer in a church. Everybody's talking and interacting, and I'm just standing there all by myself. And what I discovered was that I had to put myself out there. You know, I had to go introduce myself to somebody. And I think if you're new here or if you ever find yourself in that situation, give that a try. Say hello to somebody. And you'll find that the people here are uh, open and welcoming, uh, most of them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't thinking of any particular <laughs> Uh, in addition to opening the, the service, uh, I was asked to pray, so please join with me in, in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, you are a great and awesome God, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. And we need to seek your will daily. And that's coming to Christ the very first time, is, is bending the will, yielding the heart to you, yielding, yielding the mind, yielding the will to you. But then we need to walk that, we need to walk in that, and do that repeatedly, moment to moment. And, that, and you know that that's a hard thing. We do need your power, we do need the Holy Spirit to help us that way. So I just ask that you give us that, that you give us and send us your Holy Spirit to help us on our individual walks. Lord, you've made it clear that we can come to you with all of our needs, be they financial or health, whatever they may be, relational, who knows, you know. You know every last thing about us. Your word says the hairs in our head are all numbered. So if you know that, if you know us so intimately, you know exactly how to deal with any situation we may face. And we can come to you and trust that you, you will act. Sometimes it's very mysterious. Sometimes we pray and we believe it's according to your will and nothing happens or so it appears. But that calls for faith. Just to wait on you, to trust you, regardless of what's going on around us. Very important thing to do. Help us to do that. Help us to just trust you, to wait on you, to realize that walking in this earth is, is difficult. Jesus said that we can we can count on trouble. In this world you have will have trouble. But we we need not we need to not forget that second part. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We can we can be of good cheer, regardless of what's going on around us. Lord, you know about our strengths, our weaknesses, and our failings. And you say even when we drop the ball, when we sin, which is inevitable living in this life as we are, that we can come to you for forgiveness if we'll just confess our sins. So we do that, Lord. We, we just do that silently in our heart when we've blown it. Just, Lord, I have. And, and admit it. And, and we can count on your forgiveness and your blessing and your restoration. And Lord, the, the evil one uh, does try to trip us up in the world around us. But again, in your word, you tell us that we can resist him. And Jesus even prayed that we would be protected from him. So I just ask for your protection for each one here, each family here, for this church. And I ask and pray that you will move in hearts and minds today so that everything that is said and done in this church during this service honors you, brings you glory and builds up each one here. And I thank you in, in your precious name. And everyone said it. Amen. Amen.
interpretive dance. Right yeah. Hey, Steve. Oh, here today. Okay. Welcome, and um, let's stand together and worship.
And we just ask that you would, um, would move in our hearts today. And um, just that we would realize who you are and, and how you're with us, even when it seems like you're not. So we give you our worship and, and um, our praise. We know that you're good. Amen. joy that God gave me. I had a clear report for my yeah. annual song, You're All I Want, Draw Me Close to You. That's a great, uh, that's a great lead in as to what's been on my heart um, these last couple of weeks, really. Uh, I don't want to break the flow, but I just feel, I just need to just share just briefly a couple <coughs> quick announcements. Next week, we've got the Teen Challenge Choir coming, or Teen, not Choir, group, uh, coming to share their testimonies, and that's always a really meaningful time. Um, so I just want to remind you of that, I encourage you to come on out and support them. Also be praying for the high and as we seek to ask God how to start that this fall and the small groups as well. It'll be, there's going to be a lot of things rolling like uh, Steam Shark have a lot to do in this short time. Um, so just be praying for that. And, uh, yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity, which I, I, I tried to do this summer, is take specific, uh, I, I bought a, a, a provincial parks pass this summer because I wanted to be uh, strategic and saying I want to just take times away just and just be, be, be quiet and just enjoy. So we're doing that and it's been really, really wonderful. And so a couple of weeks ago I was at Craig Leaf there just outside of Collingwood. There's a park down, there. it's right along, you know, the high wiggles along the waters there. And uh, it was a clear afternoon, sunny, and there was a strong onshore uh, breeze. And so I went there and I sat in my lawn chair about five feet from where the water and the waves were beautiful because of that wind coming on shore. It was, I was sitting there just reading, just being quiet. And um, it was one of those, you know, those times which just, this is a perfect moment. It was. The weather was perfect, uh, the surf was wonderful, and it was like I had this whole section to myself. I could see some people down the way, see their silhouettes, seeing them, the kids jumping in the water. And I, I thought, this is just a perfect moment, and I just want to, I want to soak in this moment. I want to, and have you ever had that experience where this is so good, I wish I could just soak it in, but I don't even feel I have the capacity to soak it in, you know? it's. It's kind of like eating something really good, you know. Oh man, I'm getting full. That's a drag. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's just that moment, and, and I was sitting there and saying, I want to enjoy this. And then eventually, uh, this group set up a, a barbecue uh, about ten yards away or so, and the smell of the cooking meat was so. <laughs> I'm like, oh. all of a sudden, I'm starting to feel hungry, and I'm thinking, but no, I want to stay in this moment, right? And I'm like, hunger was going, and I'm like. But then I thought, you know what, I'm going to let this hunger drive me into enjoying this moment more. And I'm thinking, I bet you I'm enjoying this moment more than they are, because they're distracted by eating, and I'm doing this. Eventually, I got something to eat. But um, I'm going to be talking this morning about someone who sometimes hunger, different kinds of hunger, can bring clarity to our lives. It could be physical hunger, it could be spiritual hunger. And I just love that song, you know, that you're all I need, you're all I've ever wanted. 
You know, sometimes we get so full of distraction of this world that we, we lose our hunger. We lose that sense of saying, yeah, God, you're really all I need. But then there's other times when we're driven back to that, say, Lord, you're all I really want. You're all I really need, that hunger. Sometimes circumstances drive us back to that. We're going to be talking a little bit about that. And, uh, but quick spoiler alert, one of the things that I was reading a book, a Tim Keller book, where I was sitting by the surf, and he was talking about when Jesus, you know, he was crucified, the disciples were scattered, Peter denied him, and all this stuff. Jesus is risen again, and he goes to the disciples. And, and you know, in our natural state, you think, I'm, Jesus is probably pretty mad. These disciples think, you know, you guys deserted me, Peter, you denied me, you guys just, you know, Jesus, there's none of that. Jesus came, peace. He came to meet the needs. And in essence, Tim Keller, he just, he, it was just a line in this book, and it just jumped out at me, and he says, Jesus just said, I want you back. I want you back. And that line just stuck in my spirit. It's been just churning for a couple weeks, saying that's really, if you could summarize the Gospels, if you could summarize the Old Testament, it's about people, flawed people, falling away, leaving God, and God saying, I want you back. I want you back. So, you know, if you have to leave right now, that's pretty well what this sermon's going to be. <laughs> you know? uh, but that whole theme of the heart of God reaching out to each one of us, I want you back. And you may be sitting here saying, well, I don't need to go back because I'm already back. Maybe you are. But you might not always be. Or maybe there's areas in your life. But anyway, so that was just kind of how this whole thing started unfolding for me. Um, just that time of experiencing that little bit. Like I haven't really been, truthfully, I don't think I've ever been really hungry in my whole life. Maybe a couple times, you know, a little bit hungry. But compared to what many people experience, I've never been hungry. Right? But that short experience of being hungry, uh, it, kind of, it kind of clarified things a bit for me. It kind of drove me back. And so, that, so we're going to be talking a little bit about, about uh, as someone experiencing hunger. I should get my notes out. That would probably really help. Someone experiencing hunger and how it drew them back, how it brought clarity. And um, so life is a lot like balloons, like flying in a hot air balloon. And uh, so, yeah, you can go to the next one. So, you know, in life, we, we, you remember back in the day, Barry used to have this hot air, hot air balloon festival. I used to love it. It was so beautiful, these balloons. And I used to love, one, one time we, we tried chasing a balloon to see where it would land. And, but the idea is you really only have control over whether or not you're going to launch and your elevation. Other than that, you don't, you don't, like you want to pick a good day, right? You want to pick a day that's calm and you, you know, because you can really only control your elevation when you're coming. But, and I think a lot, life is a lot like that. Like we basically launch, and there's a lot of things that carry us and move us. And we might think we're in control. But we are to a certain extent. Like we do make choices, but there's a lot of factors in our lives that move us one way or the other. And, we, and the reality is we all have expectations. We have expectations of our life, how our life should go. We have expectations of other people. We have expectations of God. And all of those things, even though we might not say them, we have those things. And, and that affects, um, well, that just affects how we look at life. You know, because our expectations usually get let down. Usually our expectations as to where our balloon's going to flow gets let down, or people let us down. And sometimes we blame God, and we say, God, I, I, I expected my life should be like this, or it should go there. But the reality is, we're like this, these hot air balloons moving along. And so, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at a parable, and it's one of Jesus' most famous parables, and it's, and uh, you can stay on the balloons for a minute, Liam, but it's about the prodigal son. And, um, and the prodigal son is very well known, and, and but before we go there, I'd like to just set the context. Jesus, again, was talking to a mixed crowd. There was religious leaders and there was like sinners, right? The good people, the bad people. And again, the religious people were saying, Jesus, why are you hanging out with this riffraff? Like Jesus, you know, and they were always getting upset about who Jesus spent time with and how he related to the law. And so Jesus 
in response to that, says three parables. And all three parables are about losing something. The first parable is about, is about the lost sheep. And it goes like this. Jesus says there's this shepherd. He has a hundred sheep. One goes astray. He goes and he leaves the 99 and he goes and finds a hundred. And they rejoice over that one that's found. The, the, the shepherd sought out that one. So all you math experts, how many... What percentage of that shepherd's net worth was missing? One percent, right? Hundred sheep, one goes lost, and yet the shepherd, he goes seeking after that one percent. The next parable, this woman, in her house she has ten coins. And one of those coins gets lost. And Jesus says she sweeps her house, she looks all over for that one coin. When she finds it, there's great rejoicing. I, I lost my coin, now I found it. And great rejoicing. Again, the emphasis is on the rejoicing of the finding. Let me ask you a question, you math experts. What percentage of her net worth was lost? Ten. Ten percent. So the first parable, one percent. The next parable, ten percent. And then Jesus comes to the prodigal son. This time, he's got this dad. He has two sons. One son goes lost. What, that's not net worth, but what percentage of what value is it to the dad? 50. Well, yeah, we could say mathematically 50, but really, it's, it's really, it's so much more than that, right? Because it's a son, like it's not like a coin, it's not a sheep. So the parables build like in value. Like first it's like 1% a sheep, next it's 10% like a coin, the next is like like, yeah, everything. you got two sons and one is lost. It's huge. But the question is, in the first and second parables, the owners or whatever, they took action. They, the, the shepherd, he sought out the sheep. The woman, she swept her house. But the last parable, when the person, the father is experiencing such great loss, does he go and seek his son? No. He does not. He waits. He waits. So Jesus is packing He's kind of building people up, right, with each parable. And then he's lodging these questions in their mind. Oh, wait, wait a second. This is insurmountable. And yet the Father chooses to wait. The other thing about parables, before we jump into it, is sometimes we can lose the effect of, of dissecting parables and looking for every little meal. Oh, this means that. This means. Generally, when Jesus spoke a parable, they had like one or two main thrusts. And... And, and the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the details are really not as important. I'll give you an example of how this works. Oh, it's my water. Oh, here it is. So remember that Jesus also told a parable once about the, the persistent widow with the unjust judge. He talked the idea of how there's this woman, this widow, and she went to a judge and she says, give me justice. And the judge says, well, I don't fear you. I don't fear God. You've got no money. You've got no influence. Get out of my sight. Right? And and the idea is the woman keeps coming back and back and back. And finally the unjust judge says, I don't care about this woman. I don't care about justice. But because she's bugging me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her a response. And then Jesus goes on and he says, this is to show you that you should pray and not give up. Well, someone, if they were dissecting that, they could say, well, I guess God is an unjust judge. I guess God doesn't really care. I guess God just, he just gets upset. He gets tired of me pastoring him. But see, that's not the way parables work. Jesus showed us God is not an unjust judge. God is not someone who doesn't care. Those, those details are really not important. The point is, Jesus was saying, you need to pray and not give up. So when we look at parables, we try to, we try to bring us the simple line that Jesus is trying to bring up. And so when we look at the prodigal son, that's what we want to do. Now, I need help with this because, and you can go to the next slide. Because many of us, we're familiar with the prodigal son and, you know, kind of like, well, this is really boring. I've heard this a million times before. So what I'd like to do is try to bring it into the present. Okay, so I need someone to volunteer to be the prodigal son, or it could be a prodigal daughter, it doesn't matter, but to try to bring it into current. So I need someone who's brave and a great actor. And, well, yeah, I was thinking of Kim. Let's see, any takers? Who wants to be the prodigal son? You don't have to be young. You can be less than young. 
<laughs> so, I mean, any takers? Any takers? Who wants to be the prodigal son here? John. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Yeah, I'm looking at you, John. John Hunter. You'd be pro All right, give me a big hand. Yeah. Okay, so, cool. so, John, what we're going to do is you're going to help us to visualize this whole idea of the prodigal son. Okay, so I'll pretend I'm the dad. My son, good looking son. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Jesus says, he says, so there's this man. What's it? Are you gonna say there's son? I'm gonna make it. So anyway, so the son comes to his dad. And he says, Dad, give me the share of my property now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait for you to die. I just want your stuff. Give me my share, right? And the father obliges. So again, this is not a dialogue on how you should be a good, a good father. That's that's a detail that we we just gotta let go, right? Because most dads would say, I don't think that's really wise. But anyway, this father, he says, You want you want your share? Okay, no problem. I'm gonna give you your share. So he gives him all this cool stuff, because this is a young guy. So you're prepping, so you got a Yeti coffee cup, because you know you, you, just, you got you want the best, right? You got a Yeti, you got this fancy here, okay, and, and there's more, but you should have put this on, there's a special, really expensive coat, put that on, I don't know if that'll fit you actually, but give her a try there, buddy, oh good lord, <laughs> there we go, okay, and, and there's more, do it up, John, do it up, a very, a very expensive watch, okay, you get to, Put this on there. Put that on. So he's got a watch. He's got his fancy clothes. Because he's getting all the way. He's probably got a whole digital wall full of Bitcoin. You know where his money is? Right? You know this money? So he's like rocking it, right? He's like, okay, awesome, Dad. So I want you to read out this sign, okay, that tells basically how great life is and what you're going to do, right? So in the parable, like as a good dad, you say, hmm. This is probably not wise for the dad to do this, but this is what the dad did. Now, let me guess. This young guy here, he probably has expectations, right? He's launching his balloon. He's got all this money, and he's probably got expectations of what his life is going to look like, right? His father, other people who are older, they probably have an idea of where it's going to go. But you've got expectations. These signs, this sign might help you. But so read it out with, with, um, with, with you know, with figure. And there's multiple signs. Multiple so. signs. I deserve it. Oh, wait, it's spread out. I deserve it all now. Vegas, here I come. Vegas, here party. Party time. Okay, flip it over. Everything, Everything is awesome. Is awesome. Right? It's awesome. Vegas or bust. Oh, Vegas or bust. Oh, there's one more. What's one more? What's this one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got it. So, so this is like, so this is like this, this prodigal son, I mean, he's just gotten a huge lump of money. And his expectations are, I'm going to live life, right? I'm awesome. It's cool, right? Right on. And, you know, so you get your Bitcoin. So anyway, what happens is, though, he's, he went out and he partied, he went to Vegas, he had lots of friends, everybody loved him. But then what happened, <laughs> exactly, exactly, but then what happened was, as famine comes, or in our situation, the economy starts to crash, and maybe someone hacks your Bitcoin wallet and steals all your Bitcoin, right? And you start to lose stuff. It's a hat, right? Your Yeti cup, that's gone, right? And so, you know, times are turning bad. Right? The bullet, his expectations, not so good. And then the watch, got to have the watch. Oh, the watch, <laughs> right? He's giving, can you feel what that'd be like? You've, you had it all, but now you're losing it all, right? And now your jackets, your jacket's gone. Did I give you anything else? <laughs> my Bitcoin, give me back my Bitcoin. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so he went and he's, He's got to try to find a job. Okay, so you know he's trying to, and he's feeding pigs. So now he's trying to get make ends meet. He's eating. He's feeding with pigs. When he left, he looked good and he smelled good. Now he looks bad and he smells bad. And so what's happening is, okay, 
what's happening is, is now he's hungry, and his now his clothes have changed. Okay, we can leave this on. I'm gonna put this on you. Okay, this raggedy old thing here. And, and you have a new sign. You have a new sign. I feel like I'm walking down the runway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't mess it. Don't mess it. You look bad and you smell bad. You're not walking down the runway. So the point is, the point is, things have gone against him. Not what he expected. And now he's got a new sign. Okay, so now you're holding this sign. Okay? Falling on hard times. Now, how many of us, what's that? No. You don't really look hungry, but you, but you are. So anyway, so where was that? Oh yeah, so as we can see, he's, you know, feeding pigs. Okay, you can go to the next uh, slide. So then he's, he said to himself, like, here I am. I'm perishing with hunger. I'm going to go to my dad. And he makes this, in his mind, as he's standing there, maybe by the side of the road, holding the sign, he, he makes himself... This idea, this is what I'm going to say to my father. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven. Verse 18, and before you, verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm not worthy anymore. I've lost it all. I'm dressed in rags. I'm pulled in the side. And this is when I, in full disclosure, okay, and you guys probably sing, when I drive up the ramp onto Bayfield Street and there's someone holding a sign like that. In my mind, I think, should I give them, are they really worthy? They probably wasted their money. I've worked hard for my money. Are they really worthy of my money? That's what goes through my mind. And so this is a really contemporary parable. This idea of worthiness. Father, I'm coming home. I'm no longer, I used to, he, obviously he thought he was worthy at one time when he looked good and he smelled good. But now he doesn't look good. It doesn't smell good. You still smell. But the idea of I'm no longer worthy. But we see here, while the son was a long way off, in verse 20, the father saw him. Now, how would the father see him when he was a long way off? He was watching for him. He was looking for him. He was at, he didn't chase him. What was that? He smelled him. <laughs> You guys are really messing with it. It doesn't say that. So, maybe he did. I don't know. So, but, the, but the point is, the father, even though the father didn't chase him and force him, you see, with a sheep, well, the sheep does have its own kind of free will, but a sheep is stupid, well, even stupider than a prodigal son. Right? And smellier. Maybe. Well, I know. But, and a coin, well, obviously a coin doesn't have But a son, a, a person has their own will. And if they choose to launch their balloon and make choices, then God is not one to force us, but he waits and he watches because he wants his son back. Amen. The father wants him back. And we see this. So the son comes. And he says, Father, he does his little speech here. And he says, Father, I've sinned. I'm no longer. You could choose to say that to me. That'd be really good to hear. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's okay. The father comes and he embraces his son. Because the father says, I want you back. <laughs> I smell. This is, like, this is like a really serious moment here. Right? So, yeah. the, point is, the point is, the son thinks he's no longer worthy. I mean, he really isn't. But the father wants him back. That's the story of the gospel. The father wants him back. Thanks so much, John. Good job, by the way. So anyway, okay, so let's read some more. So we see in verse 21, uh, the son says his speech, Father, I sinned against you before heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his son, said to his servants, bring the best robe. On. Bring the ring, put it on his hand, bring the shoes. Again, he changes his clothes, he gives him the best, and they slaughters the fatted calf. He says, we need to celebrate for my son was dead, he was lost. But now the father wanted his son back. You see, no matter whether the son was wearing fancy clothes and was rocking it in life, or whether he was wearing rags, he was still his father's son. He was still his father's daughter. And his father wanted him back. 
Now, the next slide, Jesus says, the son had another brother. And this brother here, it says, um, where are we here? Yeah, so the older son, he's in the field, he hears about this, and his older son gets really angry the fact that his father embraced his son because what was missing? So the son came back, the father, and he said, no, I'm no longer worthy. The father embraces him, puts a new robe on him. What was missing on his father's, in that exchange? His brother wasn't there. His brother wasn't there, but there was no retribution. There was no, there was no, there was no speech from the father saying, yeah, you know what, son, you really blew it. Like I gave you, I gave you half my inheritance, and you blew it, and now you just expect me to come back and pretend nothing ever happened? Like seriously? Bruce, you got your hand up. Okay, go for it. The thing is, looking at that, it's obvious that the uh, the servants were having fun trying to make life really, really nasty for the family. The servants? Yes. Look at it. Think about it. I have thought of that. There you go. It's true, though. The servant was coming and telling. Oh, he he was digging. He was trying. Oh, okay, good point. Oh, yeah. Okay. Think about that. Good point. The servant was probably yeah. He, he probably knew that your older brother had that tendency, and he was probably digging. Right? He says your son's back. Your father's killed. Your good point. He was probably the servant was probably relishing in that. But the reality is, the the son, the older son, he had an expectation. We all have expect, and his expectation is my dad is going to kick his butt. My dad was going to make him pay. And when his dad didn't do that, he got mad. Because he had, and you're right, maybe the servant was just goading that expectation, right? You see, everybody had, a, the younger son had an expectation. The older son had an expectation. And the thing that they agreed on, they're very different, but they agreed on one thing. This guy is no longer worthy. They had expectations, but the father wanted his son back. You see, there is justice. There will be justice for every one of us. But there is a difference between retributive justice and restorative justice. Retributive justice says, I just want to make you pay. I just want my pound of flesh. They're not worried about restoring. Where there's restorative justice. And you see, when Jesus went to the cross and says, I'm going to pay the price for you. Yeah, there is justice. But I'm going to pay because... I want you back. I'm going to pay for this because I want restorative justice. I want restoration. Now, many of us may have broken relationships, and we're like, I can't do that. And that idea of that amount of grace is overwhelming. But this is the parable. And the point of the parable is the Father wants you back. Jesus wants you back. And all of these other things are packed in around it. And so that... Is, is the illustration that Jesus comes back. Now, here we are. Okay, go to the next verse. Our uh, next slide, please, Liam. So, um, as, so over the years, uh, over the years, many years, <laughs> of working with people and stuff, there's, there's patterns that you see in people, because we're all basically the same. And so Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says this. He's talking to people who are trying to walk in, in the right way before God. And he says, make every effort to live in peace. Because that's a challenge. The challenge is, it's a challenge to get along with one another. It is. That's hard. Yeah. It's hard to really get along. So he makes every effort to, be, to get along with each other, to live in peace, and to be holy, to walk in the way God will want you. And then he says this, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble in the father. So what happens is, so it's very common that people have interpersonal problems. That's really common. The other thing that's super common is people's expectations get let down and they get bitter. They get bitter and they miss the grace of God. It's like this. It's like the father's there saying, I see that you have been let down, that you're expect and you're getting bitter. Now, not in every area of your life. Maybe. And the Father's saying, I want you back. I'm not going to force you, but I want you back. But sometimes when we get entrenched in bitterness, we refuse the grace of God. And that's the idea of missing the grace, falling short of the grace. God's saying, I, I, I want you back, but if you're going to hold on to this bitterness, you're going to miss the grace that I have.
had for you. So people getting upset with each other, people's expectations be that and, and dealing with bitterness, and of course sexual immorality, I mean, that's like another very common thing. And so over the years, that's those are things that I've come across over and over and over again, is that that's, the way, that's what it is to be a flawed human, right? That we, we struggle with that. But what I want to focus on today is that this picture of the Father, our loving Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ saying, I want you back. But sometimes we have expectations that stop us from coming back because we get bitter, we get upset, we think people let me down, God's let me down. So probably about, oh, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago, I went through a time when I was really, my expectations quite on, and I've shared this before, this is not new news to you guys, my expectations for like what it meant to, to pastor the church and pastor Christians and all that stuff, they were disappointed. And I was like, God, honestly, your church sucks. Like, your people suck. And I'm just, and, and I spent like about a couple of years just grumbling, like whining and grumbling to myself. Right? And there was a time when I thought, I don't know if I'll ever be involved in pastoring you because I'm just, and then, and then over time, God saying, John, I want you back. Are you going to let this be a blockage to my grace? Are you going to let this? And over time, God drew me back. And honestly, this experience, for example, being part of the pastoral staff at ECC has been such a gift to me. And I say, God, thank you for drawing me back. Thank you for saying, John, I want you back. You can go to the next slide. Because we all have things that can separate us from the grace of God. Now, um, the church... Like, we, we understand that, that Noah's Ark was amazing, and I, I mean, we're actually just looking at some cool pictures of Noah's Ark. And, but the reality is, it's full of all kinds of animals, and I don't know who did the chores, right? I don't know how that all worked, but I'm guessing that place was stinky. And I had this professor say to me, or not to me, but to our to class years ago, and always stuck me, he says, you know, the church is a lot like Noah's Ark. Sometimes it really stinks. It really stinks. But it's the only thing afloat. Like, where else are you going to go? Right? Sometimes, and, and that's sometimes what happens in, in my experiences. I said, God, you know, there's, where else can I go? And coming back in, in this time with at ECC, being with God's people, has been a wonderful restoration for me and a blessing for me. But my point is, in all of this, is we all go through journeys. We have expectations. And those expectations, sometimes they don't get fulfilled or get down, and we, we, we get mad. We get like the older brother. You see, the older brother was as much a prodigal son as the younger brother. You see, because he thought, I can just earn my, if I'm good enough, and he missed the whole idea of the grace of God, too. They both missed it, but he was upset because the father didn't kick the younger son's butt. Right? The father wanted to give grace. He had expectations. And so, the father was saying, I want you back. Um, let's go to the next slide. Ian, please. So, for, so John chapter 1, um, the, as John opens up, he, he, he's describing, he's, he's actually quoting John the Baptist, who's describing Jesus and what Jesus, who Jesus was. And, and John the Baptist says this, he says, from the fullness of, of his grace, being Jesus, we have received one blessing after another. The message, the message puts it like this, we all live off his generous bounty, gift after gift. So here's the picture. This is how it works. We come to God by grace, and when we receive his grace, we receive his good gifts, one after day after day after day. We receive his gift, but sometimes we don't even see them. So, like for example, when I was sitting at that beach in Craigleith, and I said, God, this is amazing. This is a gift of your grace right now, right this moment, and I want to appreciate it. And sometimes we go through life and we're so busy that we don't appreciate the daily gifts of grace that God gives us every single day. Every single day. We miss it, and sometimes we miss it because we're bitter. Because we've let something grow up in us and we miss the grace of God. God is saying, I want you back. 
But because you're, you're blinded by your bitterness, you're blinded by your busyness, you're not seeing my daily gifts of grace. So, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm changing gears. We're not really go about what we are going to Nova Scotia for a while, but I'll still be around. I won't be, like when I come back, I won't be like, preaching as regularly. And so I thought, you know, what, what, what could I, what can I do? How could I summarize my heart for you? And my heart for how God works. And I have to summarize in that is that, you know, no matter where you are this morning, maybe online, or maybe you know someone, no matter where you are, you may feel unworthy, and truthfully, we're all we're all not worthy. None of us are worthy. But wherever you are, whatever that barrier is, God wants you back. Jesus is calling you back. He says, I know you might. You might think that I don't want you back. You might think that, like the prodigal son, well, when I go back to dad, he's going to kick my butt. I got this big speech prepared. You know, you may think that, but Jesus is saying, I want you back. I don't want you feeling like you don't, you don't fit or you don't deserve it. I want you to come back to me. I want you to allow me to embrace you. I want you to allow the gifts of my grace to come into your life. And, um, so, how does this work? Well, for example, coming back to it, is in a really practical sense, okay, in a really practical sense, comes back to looking at our expectations and being willing to say to God, saying, well, God, I expected this, and this is what happened. I'm really upset about it. There's nothing wrong with being honest and saying, God, I'm really upset. I expected this, and this happened, or this didn't happen. There's nothing wrong with process. It's when we don't process that 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 becomes it festers into bitterness. It's when we it's when we deny that and we don't. And it's hard work. It's not comfortable. So for example, so for example, that um, that slide just before. Oh, we're still up there. Perfect. Setting your expect. Here is the expectation. This is where your expectation should rise. Is God? I want to set my expectations on your grace, on whatever I need today. Today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, whatever I need today, I want to live up of what I need today, your blessing for today. That's where our expectations need to rest. They're not going to rest on people. So, for example, when Steve and Charlotte come back, I can pretty well, ex I can pretty well predict, not because I'm really all that smart, but just because of life, that some of you, they will not fulfill your expectations. Some of the, you know, I mean, they're going to come back and they're going to have like a whole bunch of stuff to think about and to do. And just the nature in a crowd this side, some of you are like, wow, oh, man, they're, they're not really going to get a job. Oh, man, I expect this. See? And, and, and we, we put expectations on people or myself, right? You're, some of you might be sitting here, well, I'm really glad he's not going to do that because that really <laughs> sucks, right? You know, like, I mean, we, we all, we're all flawed, right? And we set expectations and to come back and say, Jesus, I want to take expectations off people. The only expectation I want to have is to be able to look to your grace. To say, Lord, I expect to see your grace. I don't know how it's going to show up, but I wanted to see it show up. So as an application, well, what do we got for the last slide there? Um, okay, so as an application, this is what I'd like to challenge you to do. Okay? Is to simply make up a little sign. So we had a couple of signs here today. Make up a little sign and put it, put it somewhere where you're going to see it. Like maybe on your fridge or you'll put it on your phone if that works. But I'm into more analog stuff, so I like to actually make a sign. Make a sign and you can say, Jesus wants you back. Or maybe make it personal. Jesus, whatever your name is, right? Or Jesus wants me back. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it so that Day by day, when you're going through your day and you find yourself and your mind sees that sign, you can say, okay, what am I thinking about? Am I being frustrated by some kind of expectations? Because usually, that, if we're frustrated, it's usually because we've got an expectation and that's not being met. So when we look at that sign, it's okay, wait a second, Jesus wants me. He wants me back from that thing. Jesus, I'm coming back. So here's this thing that's frustrating me. Jesus, I'm going to bring that to your feet. I'm coming back to you. Jesus wants you back. And that is something that 
is um, helpful in order to open yourself to the grace of God. Again, whatever area, because this is the way. This is what it looks like: is the Father is standing there and He's looking for you. He's not going to chase you down and browbeat you and manipulate you. God is not manipulative. He doesn't treat you like a robot. But He's watching. He's looking for you. He wants you back. And He's saying, "Will you just come and will you receive my grace?" I have literally met people. I've sat with people where they said, "No, I'm so mad. I will not receive." God's grace. No. I'm, I'm so mad. And I've actually, you know, I've been there myself. I don't know if you guys remember the time I fell off my motorcycle when I was, again, a stupid young person. And I was so mad at God. And I actually said to God, I shook my fist at God and said, God, if this is the way you're going to treat me, well, I might not serve you. <laughs> Big letdown for God, right? <laughs> really? So, but sometimes we just get so angry that we say, we think we're, it's like, we think we're hurting God by not receiving his grace. It doesn't make logical sense, but that's what we are. And then the next thing is, is also to remember when we see others, wherever they may be, maybe at the, the off-ramp on the 400 or whatever, when we see someone else, remember, Jesus wants them back. Jesus wants them back. Jesus wants that person back. So maybe, you're, maybe it's all good with you, but when you see someone else, realize Jesus wants them back. And maybe... Depending on personality, you'd be like, yeah, Jesus, you need to kick that person's butt. Right? But I don't know, it's not for you to say, not for me, but the reality is Jesus wants them back. And maybe you can be a part of it. Because you can bet, you can bet that if a person's heart is, is the least bit towards God, that Jesus is drawing and he's pulling them back. So Jesus wants them back, whatever their name is. So as we close today, um, and so I, I just, I, I'm just going to go back to that song because the words are just so good. I love it. That song we sang, draw me close to you, never let me go. I lay it all down again. Again, I lay it all down. Just to hear you say that I'm your friend. Just to hear you say that I'm, that, that, to hear God say, I want you. I want you. That's such a powerful song. And to talk about you are my desire, nothing else will do. That is a song. That's like a prayer of responding to the grace of God. Saying, God, will you draw me again? Draw me close to you again. God, I confess I've been bitter. I confess I've been struggling. And I've allowed that to dissipate. But will you draw me close again? I lay it all again. I just want to hear you say it. And then, you know, that whole picture is so beautiful. So as we, as we <coughs> finish today, um, I would like just to take a moment and just pray together with you guys again that God would show you. Because most of us, especially if we're sitting here, like most of us are not like shaking our fists at God. But many of us still have areas in our lives where we've kind of sealed off. Well, that's an area of that we're just, we're just disappointed and we're just kind of bitter at maybe a person or maybe at God and saying, like, I just don't want to deal with that. Because it's ugly. It's not, it's not, it's not, not easy, right? But maybe God's putting his finger on that and saying, if you, if you want to receive my grace, you've got to be willing to let go of that expectation of what I should do or what that person should do or did do. So I'm just going to lead us in prayer for a second, okay? Father God, I thank you that even as we sit here, even as there's people online, loving Father, as you've shown in Jesus Christ, you're watching for us, you're longing for us, you want us back. Father, whatever area it is in our, in, in our lives, Lord, you know, God, and I just pray by your spirit that you will, you will speak to each person here and speak to me and online. And show us an area maybe where we have wandered away, where we've kind of built a wall, where we've been like that prodigal, or maybe the older brother, where we've been like self-righteous and said, well, I'm good and everyone else is, you know, whatever. Lord, will you show us, Father, areas where we have distances, where we're not receiving your grace? Will you help us to hear your voice saying, I want you back. And Father, I pray, Lord, for anyone here that can hear my voice who doesn't, who feels like I'm just not worthy. I cannot accept the grace of God because I'm not worthy. Or I, I can't believe that God wants me back. Father, I pray by your spirit that you will help them to lay that down and simply like the prodigal son, to receive your embrace, just to receive your grace. And hear that voice, I do want you back. 
None of us are worthy, but you want us back. So, Father, accomplish that by your spirit, we pray. And we thank you for the proof of that in the way Jesus was willing to lay his life down for us and pay the price for us, that we could be redeemed. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think, um, uh, I think we have one more song. So I can ask the musicians up. Anybody got any questions or comments on what we've talked about this morning? Just no. I, I just have one thing in thinking through the, the whole parable of the lost son. The father wasn't uh, condemning of his younger son, and he doesn't come across as condemning of his older one either. Um, he actually says to him, all I have is yours. I have is yours. And I think sometimes Christians who have been walking with the Lord a long time and got disappointed at different times, we just have to go back to say, all the Father has is ours. So well said, Malcolm. That was so true. And that willingness, yeah, absolutely right. God is not that retributive mindset. He's restoring. And all he had, yeah, very well said. We have to remember that. Well, bless us and <coughs> lead us, and thanks, guys, for your uh, grace.